This is your host, Abby Martin. If you didn't hear already through social media, I have a brand new weekly podcast called Dosed. While it still covers some of the deep political topics you're used to from us, it's also very different where I'll be interviewing scientists, artists, philosophers, and other fun and enthralling topics that don't normally fit into our Empire Files content. The show is on a very cool new app called Colin, where every week I'll go live with a super interesting guest and be able to take calls from the audience. Everyone who wants to engage should download Colin, subscribe to the show, and join the discussion. But if you want to listen on other platforms, every episode will be on Spotify and Apple Podcasts after we end the live show. So make sure to search for Dosed with Abby Martin on those platforms and subscribe there too. Our debut episode explains much more about what this new project is and why we're doing it. But our second episode, with our first ever guest, is what you're about to listen to. Because Dosed is all about topics and conversations that have been mind-altering moments, I thought it would be fitting to have on Peter Joseph, who dosed around a billion people with his ultra-viral film, Zeitgeist. So this is just a long sampling of the episode. For the full conversation and the audience calls, you can only listen through the Dosed channel on Colin, Spotify, or Apple. We won't really be posting Dosed episodes here on the Empire Files channel, but I just thought this discussion was relevant to our usual content and I wanted to make sure you all knew about this new project I'm really excited to be doing. So I hope you enjoyed the discussion and join me to get dosed every week. Welcome to Dosed, everyone. This is your host, Abby Martin. For those who didn't tune in to the first episode, this show is slightly different from my other work. Um, Mike, can you hear me okay? My, my audio just dropped a little bit. Yep. You know, for those who know me from Empire Files and Media Roots Radio, yeah, Empire Files is very enlightening. It could also be very heavy. Media Roots Radio is more of a cathartic outlet for me. And for the last few years, I felt really siloed off, honestly, into this kind of dark black hole of information. And I started to feel like I was reorganizing my brain to override other important things that make me a more dimensional person. (laughs) One of the things I miss most about my old show, Breaking the Set, was being able to cover just a range of topics and speak to interesting people that have dosed me one way or another. Really quickly, what does being dosed mean? No, I'm not talking about dropping acid, although that is one way to do it. It's much more broad than a nod to psychedelics. Dosed is a reimagination, if you will, of being red-pilled, which is kind of a passe term that now applies to partisan politics. For me, dosed really just means having an epiphany learning something that changes the way you view the world, deepens your perspective and understanding, and it really can apply to anything, art, science, philosophy, and of course, politics. So keep this in mind when you call in later in the episode to share what is dosed you. That's why I'm so excited to have the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement, author of the new human rights movement, host of the podcast Revolution Now!, and the creator of the new-ish epic mixed genre film, Inner Reflections, Peter Joseph, on Dosed Today. Peter, I am so happy to have you with us. Hey, Abby and Mike, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And congratulations on the new, uh, the new communicative venture. I like it. It's a great style. Good. <laughs> so, Peter, I'm so happy that you are my first guest on this show because... You know, not only do I think you're a brilliant visionary and one of the most important intellectuals of our time, your work has completely dosed the fuck out of me over and over and over again throughout my life. It's helped radicalize me as a young adult. It set me on the path I am today. And it continues to guide my understanding of the world and my place in it. I mean, let's just go back to Zeitgeist. I know that you only intended it as this artistic expression and nothing more. But for people who don't really know the profound influence that this film had, I mean, the original Zeitgeist was so transformative for so many. Look, this was seen not only a million times, not only 10 million or 100 million. I mean, potentially, we're talking about maybe a billion people that um, have caught wind of the themes that you presented 
in zeitgeist, uh, Peter, and it's just incredible. I mean, it was something so much bigger than you, of course, but I think that it really spoke to this moment in time, to the zeitgeist, if you will. The Bush era was such an intense time. This film captured this kind of collective outrage that had built up, I think, around the political and media establishments post 9-11 myth-making. You know, the religion part was mind-blowing, even though I didn't grow up religious. And it was dropped at a time when videos became viral on their own, believe it or not, when algorithms didn't drive what is and what is not seen. And the ultra-viral nature of that movie was completely organic. I mean, clearly it provided something that people were very much craving at that moment in time. And then, of course, you continued the series with the second and third equally fascinating editions and are actually working on a fourth chapter now. But following your trajectory, your work thereafter, especially the new human rights movement, synthesized so much for me about the structural nature of our problems. And I've really never heard anyone give a more convincing case against capitalism, which, of course, we're going to focus on. But first, Peter, I think our audience would really be interested to know, what is an early dosed moment for you? Well, first, I appreciate the kind words and the introduction. And Zeitgeist, of course, was a very strange moment because it wasn't intended, as you pointed out. Most people, when they put forward a communicative work, they have a strategy in mind to release it and to hope people pay attention to it. And usually there's an agenda of some kind, often monetary for folks. And that film had none of that and wasn't even supposed to be released at all. So that's put that aside for the moment. In terms of your question, which we can circle back around to Zeitgeist, uh, you know, I've been pondering the, the dosed premise all day uh, as I thought about your your uh, podcast here. And I was reflecting in my mind, you know, the sequence of events that sort of paints the picture or the structure of what I am at this point in time. And it's less of a spontaneous thing and more of a gradual thing. I, nothing, nothing particularly revelatory in, in an immediate sense. But I did recall this one moment when I was a kid. And I think this is just something that maybe other people might have experienced at some point. When I was maybe seven or so, and I was turning this corner with my mother in a car, and the sun was blazing in in the American South, and I had, for the first time in my life, uh, a sense of realization or a sense of questioning of what the fuck am I? Like, <laughs> what am I? Like, I, I, I scared the shit out of my mother. Because, like, so I started asking her all these ridiculous philosophical questions, and she's sitting there staring at me. Um, and, it, it, and it was one of those things I related to uh, what's called theory of mind. It's not directly related, but I don't know if you're aware of this as a mom. When your kid gets to be between three and five, you're the child will start to realize that other organisms have thinking processes that are different from their own, that there's an autonomy to, there's an autonomousness to other living things. And that's called theory of mind. And this was kind of an existential theory of mind. And I'll never forget that memory though. It really stuck with me. And then I kind of, you know, went through the normal uh, childhood more or less, um, had you know, poverty experiences that still stick in my mind. Of course, my mother was a social worker. She dealt with people in poverty and deprivation. So I had a lot of feedback from that world, uh, both academically and in my normal rural existence, which was a, a, a pretty poor area. And I was fortunate. And I think the, the inflection point for me was really the, the privilege of going to a collective arts school, an international arts school, when I was about 13 years old, up through up through high school, and then off to college in New York, uh, which I eventually dropped out of. But in that period of time, I went to this art school in the American South. I was detached away from the traditional forms, the traditional educational process, the rote learning, and of course the homogeneity of the American South, which you know it's just like any place that isn't super metropolitan. You have a kind of general culture; it tends to get stagnant, and all of that. You racism and bigotry and all those things that you will eventually absorb as a child if you're not exposed to other things. So I went to this art school as a musician. I got to meet tons of people across the whole spectrum of creativity and, of course, lifestyle and everything else. And that was a very important point, which is why I always encourage any, anyone out there raising kids to, you know, the arts and the sciences go together as one. And you have to start to get that into people's consciousness at the earliest age so it creates a flexibility in their understanding. And I was very fortunate to have that, I think, anyway. At least that's what I attribute it to. So then we jump ahead to, uh, like, New York. I'm living in New York, and I'm, 
I'm literally working as, as I, after I dropped out of, out of the conservatory there, because I didn't want to be an orchestral musician. I was going to try to do something more ambitious with my musical interests. Uh, but that was my focus. So I had to moonlight in all sorts of other ways as I tried to build a career in music. And I started working as a, I say I worked on Wall Street, not literally, even though I was, you know, in New York City. I study with uh, actual traders uh, in this period of time in my early 20s, trying to find a way basically to break away from the hierarchies of society intuitively. I don't really even know what I was thinking at that time. I just knew I didn't want to have a boss. And <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just a common reaction. In fact, a lot of these people you'll meet in the trading world were like me. They don't understand what they're doing in the, in the darkness of what they're a part of, which I'll get to in a moment, because this is another important inflection point for me. Uh, but they, they, it's really a reaction to not to have to deal with the corporate structure. That's why people want to be independent traders. That's the most core motivation aside from the greed and all that, which builds on its own. So I ended up doing that simultaneously working in advertising. So I had you know, these two jobs I did parallel, two of the worst, worst things on the face of the earth, as far as I'm concerned, advertising and Wall Street. Two of the most learned- beneficial industries. <laughs> yeah, complete uh, void industries, which, again, we can we can build upon in a, in a little while because uh, they are important staples to understand the character of civilization today uh, and getting worse and worse, unfortunately, in the evolution or the adaptation of our social system, which we can talk about more so as well. But in this environment, I started to really reflect on the social systems. Like, why am I getting paid this money to you know, create little movies for extreme wealthy people to buy, you know, $400 million penthouses in Central Park. Uh, and why am I also gambling in this little arena here, which seems to have all sorts of money that comes out of nowhere in order to just be self-serving and not contribute anything to society? Why are these two of the most lucrative industries on the face of the earth is the question, or at least in America, which, uh, you know, is probably the face of the earth as well. And that's really what started me down the rabbit hole of starting to question what the hell is going on. And that was the period of time when I began to develop Zeitgeist as a as a fourth occupation, so to speak. Uh, during that period of time, again, I was working three jobs basically. And then in the evenings, I'd come back and I would work on this little project of my own. No, no particular, uh, no particular intent, as I said earlier. And that is when it hit in 2000, excuse me, yeah, 2007. In fact, it'll almost be 15 years this summer that that film has been out, which is shocking to think about. And it was released. And uh, I just could not believe. Well, here's the funny thing. If, you, if you're familiar with New York City, you have the thing called the Village Voice. And the mm-hmm. Village Voice is a free periodical they put out with events. And I remember following at four in the morning, the Village Voice buses, these uh, trucks. And I would put little cards for the Zeitgeist showing in every single Village Voice, like thousands of them. That's how ridiculous I was in promoting this thing from the grassroots level. And so on the, the six-night run, which was completely free, it was all full of tourists, believe it or not. So in the, and the dynamic in the room, it was only like a little, you know, little 50-seat theater in Chinatown. But the dynamic was really interesting at day after day because you know people would leave, people would come back. Uh, it was a great tension uh, in given, you know, this is a live performance piece with me performing literally instruments with these two giant screens that showed the film simultaneously. And that was the original version of it. So wait, wait, that, wait. so you were perform. how long did you do this? It was a six night run. Oh, wow. And it was just, a, again, it was free it was in Chinatown. It was like this ridiculous walk up, like a six flight walk up, this <laughs> tiny little black box theater. And, and so the, the thing, you know, unfolded and it was actually, you know, very interesting. Again, some people hated it, obviously, and some people uh, really were into it. And I had a lot of unique inquiries. But at that point, I just gave up on it. I was like, okay, I got to go back to my normal job. I, I shelved it. And it was at that time when Google Video came out. And this is the other interesting thing I don't think I've talked about much to people regarding this, this uh, evolution. You might remember in 2006, 2007, Google had a campaign, billboards that said, Google Zeitgeist. <laughs> what? Yeah. So mem- this was their their kind of like TED Talk project, and they had this program they developed. I think it started around like 2002 or something, but it wasn't really that established yet. Maybe a little bit later. But it was Google Zeitgeist. It was very popular. I never thought about this, but I when that thing hit on Google Video, which was uploaded to you know just thrown up there, that I had no light legal clearance for that film whatsoever. Like it's completely and utterly <laughs> illegal. Uh, and, and, you know, I didn't, again, I expected it just to be a little archive on, online, whatever. People want to watch it. It's not a big deal. I'm not selling anything, whatever. And, it, but Google Zeitgeist was happening simultaneously. And when that thing hit viral on Google Video, it shot my website to the very top of the search engine. So when people literally Googled Zeitgeist, they got me. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I hijacked instead of I Webster's hijacked, Dictionary. It was like, <laughs> yeah, well, what I mean though is I, I literally hijacked their entire PR <laughs> campaign because remember it's Google Zeitgeist, and I and so Zeitgeist. That's one of the reasons I think it got a weird kind of umph, which you know I think it would have gotten momentum anyway. But I think a lot of people, they Googled Zeitgeist, just like they saw on that billboard, but they got, you know, zeitgeistmovie.com. It was hilarious. I'm actually really surprised that Google didn't try to, you know, restrict it. But the, the, the viral nature of that was so robust that I don't think they could get away with it. And, you know, Internet censorship wasn't as bad as it is now anyway. So that's how that kind of emerged. You know, I can go into more detail as to what went into that project. But uh, let's we can yeah. step back a moment and, and, you know, go from there. That's fascinating. I had no idea that that was part yeah. of that simultaneous uh, display of Google. You know, at the time, it was kind of this egalitarian notion of, you know, Google, the mantra, don't be evil. And it was like, everyone can just buy into these systems. And that censorship that's on full display today just was not present at all. Um, right. And of course, that's how these things, you know, that's how people like you and I have proliferated into like being people, the people that we are today and having the influence and reach that we do is because we were allowed to through the mechanisms that these social media giants provided. And and so it is just, it's just really cynical that um, they can just lock us out at any point today, but you have the the argument against that. Well, oh, they're a private company. So just don't violate their terms of service and you'll, you'll be fine. It's like, well, right. no, that's not exactly right. But let's go back to, you know, first of all, props to your mom. Uh, I, I have no idea how she harnessed and cultivated such a bu- brilliant <laughs> mind, Peter, but rest in power to Peter's mom. That's amazing. I can only imagine how she was uh, ping ponging off of your <laughs> like awakening of like, I'm a I'm a conscious sentient being that's like interconnected <laughs> with, with everything in the, <laughs> the world. Um, well, but no, that's... I really appreciate like the effort that you put into putting out Zeitgeist as just an art piece without even knowing the impact that it would eventually have, like just the amount that you did with that grassroots guerrilla marketing is, uh, is something I appreciate a lot, man. But let's go back to the stock yeah. market. Thanks. Because you mentioned that you worked in advertising and equity trading. You know, at the same time, I had no idea that you were actually there, like moonlighting, and that you were there primarily for music, um, which makes sense. But you have this insider's perspective on, I guess, the scheme of like the stock market and how all of this operates and. It's just something that's kind of in the periphery. It's like we're constantly bombarded with information. It's always in the background about the stock market, always scrolling on the bottom of our TV screens, discussed by po- politicians and pundit, excuse me, politicians and pundits as like the metric of health of our economy. But it's so fucking abstract for most Americans living paycheck to paycheck. You know, like what even yeah. is the stock market and what purpose does it really serve? I think the best way to describe it is as an evolution within the market system, within capitalism. So very briefly, years ago, you had companies, the companies needed money, people would come in, they'd invest, they'd get money from the investment through dividends or profit sharing or whatever. But there was a direct tangible relationship to somebody investing in something and getting a return based on the products or services sold. That was the way it was slowly it morphed where people realized they could kind of gamble on these these certificates these shares and they could start to trade them amongst themselves and they would have the price rise and fall based on the interest that was driving them effectively fear and greed and slowly this complete detachment started to generate which to me frankly is the core of the system This is a widget-based economic system. The purpose doesn't matter. All that matters is the demand that can be generated or exists. It's no one creates something, in other words, to solve a problem that's done by proxy. If we solve a problem by proxy, that's great, but the ultimate goal of everyone is to simply make profit. And that is an unfortunate reality we can talk about as well in general. I mean, we live in a world that so many things are governed by proxy, where you have to go through this game in order to get anything done. I mean, as a brief aside, look at the political establishment, which is completely group identified. I mean, how many votes in the U.S. Congress are straight down the party line? Why? Because they're going by proxy. It's about group versus group power dynamics. And if something good comes out of that, Uh, Well, then that's a side effect, because the first focus of all politicians is to maintain the integrity of their basically their gangs. Uh, But that's for another conversation. But that's, again, something I think about quite a bit about this proxy reality. And the economic system of markets is precisely that. 
So you have the widget. So that's all the stock and the commodity and Bitcoin or anything else, anything else is an abstraction on these exchanges is a widget that's completely detached from all reality. And it's traded in no different form and in no different consequence. Well, I, well, I'll take that back. In no different meaning than Las Vegas. It's like if you turn on the news and, you know, NBC News, and they're talking about poverty and war. Then they start talking about the craps game in Las Vegas. That's the exact equivalent thing <laughs> when they bring up the goddamn stock market. The problem, though, and here's the real problem that's happened over, the, over this evolution. I, again, it's a system adaptation. The system we live in changes based on the rise of technology and the culture morphs as well. And that's something I talk a lot about in my podcast. It's very important to understand that trend, understand where we've come from and where we're going, because this kind of abstraction of nature is getting worse and worse and worse. For example, as a brief aside, uh, because the stock market is essentially a virtual casino, it invites virtual concepts back into culture, I should say arises into culture, such as say the fact that people are trading property in the metaverse now, as if any of it's real. So we're developing new, <laughs> new nonsense, right? We're developing constant new nonsense to buy and sell, which, uh, and again, I don't want to go down these tangents, but is so deeply caustic when we're trying to solve ecological problems and solve you know, inequality problems, because the system is so perverted that if you can't find something to exploit, it's going to make something out of nothing to exploit. So you have these idiots on Wall Street creating derivatives upon derivatives. And just to put this into a more uh, social context, as opposed to abstracted, what is the major driver of all of the economic collapses we've seen in the modern era? It's all linked to the financial system and the stock market. If people paid attention to that, if they paid attention to the fact that the financial system and the stock market are at the helm of every major crash that we've seen in contemporary history, they might be a little more cynical of it. Because it's not just gambling in a casino where someone can lose all their money and that's that. Everything the stock market, Wall Street, and financialization and the rise of it has done is interweave Main Street with it. So when the shenanigans of this gambling casino crashes periodically, which it will, it takes down people and lives and jobs and well-being and the earth simultaneously. So as I've right. said before, abolish fucking Wall Street. If you want to have any little step towards sanity in this planet, let's stop the gambling casino because it's absolutely insane and completely unnecessary. Right. And it serves just this very privileged minority of people who are, as you just articulated, literally like gambling with people's lives. That's what this is. And the planet's health. Yep. Um, I want to move on to, I mean, speaking of Wall Street, you have the proximity to, of course, Times Square. Um, this is a really funny just kind of anecdote of an English author, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton, excuse me, when he first visited America in 1921, he went to see Times Square. Um, and I'm getting this from Chris Ryan's book called, I think it's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Um, okay. What's that? Civilized to death. Oh, civilized to death. My bad. Sorry, Chris. Um, but Chesterton stood staring like at Times Square for several moments. And then when someone asked him for his thoughts, he was just like, I was just thinking how beautiful this would be if I couldn't read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and like, I mean, it's such a dominant and completely useless industry across the world, of course, much of which originates from U.S. society, feeds off our deepest insecurities, exploits a lot of the sexual repression that's prevalent in this country, which could go off on a tangent all day about. I mean, manifests into this very over-the-top kind of Freudian displays. Also, of course, the most negative impact, other than the incessant consumerist nature of it, is just it makes people feel like shit. We're never good enough. We always want to be something and someone else in order to fit into the certain status or social group. And really, it just boils down to just forcing people to keep consuming at higher and higher rates to not let the economy collapse. And it just kills me to think of how many creatives are sucked into this space, wasting all of the talent, manipulating the masses into buying shit that we don't need. Right. And, you know, being in, being somewhere like Cuba many years ago, you know, there's no ads, of course, there's just like government sponsored billboards or banners about the revolution and stuff. And there was just something incredibly profound about the absence of ads, like the ability to just give your mind the space to take in your environment without feeling commodified at every turn. Because even though you may be very aware of how dominant consumerism is on a day-to-day -day basis, it's really hard to appreciate it. And it's really hard to appreciate how much you psychically crave that kind of emptiness in order to process. Yeah. 
I couldn't agree with you more. I think you nailed it on multiple levels there. I, I was, I'll annotate, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll note that in terms of system evolution, it's very important to recognize advertising and the rise of consumer culture as just that, an evolution, an adaptation of a system that was growing too technically efficient. So you have the Industrial Revolution, and this is the dawn of mechanization and extreme uh, efficient productivity, the rise of machines and the incorporation of them, which has been very much exponential since then. And so the dilemma is how do you continue a cyclical consumption, growth-based economy, uh, when you are able to meet needs that rapidly, especially when things aren't changing to an extent where people can kind of naturally adapt to new goods and services. This is, it took some time and there's a, a great work called a consumer's Republic that I recommend. And this chronicles uh, this rise of consumerism uh, quite well in terms of this dramatic change in America, which of course through colonialism spread across the world. Uh, but then again, it's still embedded entirely within the market system. In other words, it's completely expected. So you have this, this, this industrial revolution. And I think John Maynard Keynes, the you know, classic economist, say what you want about his views. He wrote an essay, a number of, well, I guess 1932, I could be wrong. Anyway, 1930s wrote an essay in this period of time describing the most common sense trajectory of what will happen in the future. And that is ideally, in other words, the most common sense if we are sane, we would adapt to the increase in surplus and abundance Costs would drop and people would reduce their work week and we would eventually naturally move into what some people would consider a socialist arrangement. But I don't use that terminology, but something where the system has become so efficient, needs are being met and and you don't need to have the ravenous consumption competitive process as it existed before to keep society going. But we didn't go that route. Instead, the collective industry and government got together and said, we have to find a way to keep this machine going. We have too much at stake, at stake in our elitist interests and in our power interests, because the corporate system is the underlying force of power politically. That is the revolving door chain that, that uh, defines effectively the political uh, contour. Excuse me, I can't talk today. And that is how we got to that point. And it's, it's very important people realize that because... It's just so depressing that all of this abundance potential, as I alluded to before, you know, we're trying to market, you know, virtual space in the metaverse and sell land and sneakers that don't exist. This is all an extension of this sickness of trying to create more and more stuff for people to consume in the interest to keep the machine going. And that is one of the most tragic trajectories uh, we've been on for a while, obviously destroying human psychology and the earth. And it, it's just going to get worse and worse unless some type of structural change is initiated or a new culture is born that can deeply reject these values, um, which is something I've been working on in terms of project planning for a while and will be featured in the new Zeitgeist film. But I won't go down that road today. Yeah. I mean, the metaverse thing is such a fucking bizarre uh, outgrowth of what you're talking about. Um, but I mean, I guess the the one one kind of light in all of this is that at least the people buying shit in the metaverse aren't like <laughs> producing all like the way like like the plastic yeah. bottles that you buy in the metaverse are really just it's true <laughs> it's like, jesus christ man maybe i should me, just become a landlord in the metaverse well, what a fucking only... disaster <laughs> yeah rent your capitalism in the metaverse it's coming i'm sure coming. let's move on to like these big yeah. picture ideas of your current projects because it's been really amazing to be able to follow your trajectory and have you and your work and your under understanding, like the evolution of your understanding of the world guide me and so many other people um, that really led you to the foundation of like the human rights, the new human rights movement, the structuralism, the unification theory, um, you know, and I appreciate that like you put out this ultra viral trilogy and throughout that process you yourself took on the responsibility of like well now i need to figure out the solution and not a lot of people do that <laughs> they just like to complain you know and and be the people pointing out the problems but you actually tasked yourself with figuring out how it can be solved which is 
unbelievable that you did that. Um, so I appreciate you doing that. And wow. you kind of synthesize all of these thoughts and philosophies in this excellent weekly podcast called Revolution Now. I highly recommend my listeners to support you and listen every week. I've learned far more from even this podcast in your book than I did through multiple years of my neoliberal indoctrination at college. Um, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. But one of the main focuses of the podcast is breaking down the kind of pillars of myths that make up our society and underpin capitalism, which essentially is like the religion of the U.S. empire. Let's talk about a couple of these. You know, and a lot of these kind of synchronize with the myths of human behavior, especially modern human civilization as well. Like, let's just start with the idea that competition is the basis of all innovation. And we wouldn't have all of what we do today if the incentives weren't there to create them. Capitalism provides those incentives. Yeah, that is the most cliche libertarian comment on the role and, and of course, defense of, of competitive behavior, which usually people find offensive, you know, and rightfully so. Uh, the very basis of a competitive posture is to seek advantage over someone else for your own personal gain, which if I remember back from kindergarten, that's usually not the way you're supposed to behave. Um, so, you know, this, this mythology has been around for a very long time, and I'll just jump to the end point. The competitive nature of innovation in our society is actually a completely destructive force. It's, what it's done is it's created an interest to innovate just through proxy. And once again, just innovate for the sake of innovation in the hope to achieve market share because everyone is in the exact same scarcity oriented, scarcity exploitating game. You're forced in some capacity, you can call yourself an entrepreneur or whatever, uh, you're forced to do something to make money. Therefore, you want to come up with something. You want to, you want to, you want to, you know, get people to jump on board with something new. That's why we have coffee cups that are connected to your iPhone. You can control the temperature. Yeah, of the just coffee watch cup. Shark Tank if you want to see the useless shit that people right. are just producing on a day to day basis to just try to like make money. I and mean, it's insulting. It is. And, you know, the competitive thing, it, it's got so many different levels of mythology. First of all, there's that fundamental thing. If you want to live on a finite planet, and coexist peacefully with people, you need a more minimalistic attitude. You don't want to be driving towards using more of the Earth's resources simply because that's what you need to do for economic income. That's insane. To keep up with the Joneses psychologically or just to get income coming because there are other people fighting for, fighting for your job. I mean, competition and war effectively, since you know, the war in Ukraine is this big shadow over the entire world right now, let's remember the entire structure of our society is premised as if we're in the jungle, but we're not. We're not in the jungle. We've built a structure where every human being is fighting for each other for market share and for work as, like, as, as corporations are. Nation states are fighting with each other to maintain dominance through effectively geostrategic economic strategy in order to, you know, to keep their sub-vassals in order and then in the network of national classism, which we've talked about before, which we can touch upon again if you like. And we've basically, long story short, we have this entire nasty arrangement of everything against everything else and is built into the very philosophy since the neolithic revolution thomas hall hobbes excuse me the great father of western philosophy stated outright i don't remember it verbatim that you know this is the nature of man we are competitive and ruthless beasts and that's just what we do and then we're not gonna you know come anything away from that which by the way if that is actually true then we might as well just kill ourselves right now to think that we are fundamentally this way and that the world that we see <laughs> around us is fundamentally Fundamentally, who we are, like in the Jordan Peterson perspective, like yeah, we're, right. We're mirroring. We might as that means we are literally committing suicide as an entire civilization. I don't think nature, anywhere in nature's dialogue, uh, or uh, anywhere in nature's programming, has it come up with a organism that just does that. So clearly, we in our half-conscious state are creating this <laughs> circumstance by introducing structures and processes that are completely incompatible with what's required to survive. Hence going back to this competitive neuroses, which to me is just deeply, deeply problematic, uh, needless to say. And there's another thing I want to mention about that. Yeah, competitive self-regulation. This isn't one of the other liber libertarian things. They, they say, well, competition isn't just about, you know, people fighting for innovation. It's also how we regulate the society. And unfortunately, that is just as detrimental because competitive self-regulation isn't just something that says, oh, well, we weed out some product that doesn't work, right? Oh, so somebody engineered something, somebody made something better, it weeds out the other product. That's competitive self-regulation. It's considered a good thing in the uh, feedback network, in the self-regulation of markets. That's the assumption that's made. But it also restricts anything new. 
it, the competitive self-regulation says, oh, well, fuck the electric cars and renewable energy. We have this giant hydrocarbon establishment and we are going to maintain this to the bitter end as long as we possibly can, no matter, you know, no matter what the greenhouse gas emission is, as is clearly evident. So you create this p- paralysis because the establishment self-preservation born from competitive self-regulation does just that. It stifles actual progress. So the illusion that you've created just around this out, that's been created, excuse me, that competition is for innovation. Yeah, competition might innovate, but it also stifles dramatically. And you'll tend to find it's stifling the things that we actually need to do while innovating things that we do not need to be doing anymore. Yeah. And of course, the reward uh, to just the most useless inane products um, just to fill this, uh, it, not even filling a gap because there is, it's like, it doesn't provide any sort of utility whatsoever for things that we actually need. And I love that you mentioned Jordan Peterson, because this is really like, I call it status quoism. It's like right. an ideology, an ideology that just endorses the status quo. It's like, well, this is just the way it is. Like looking back at like, all of human civilization and just somehow comparing uh, the evolution of, of humans to basically ants or bees or something and being like, yep, we're right. like all the hierarchies that are just natural, like this is just, we just have to reinforce what we know to be true because of how fucking ant colonies operate. It's it's really strange. Um, well, let's, yeah, and he's, let's... he's really unraveling lately. So maybe like maybe less people <laughs> will think of him as like some sort of guru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's um, a whole other subject. But I'll just comment to follow up real briefly yeah. that that uh, there is plenty of empirical evidence that humans collaborate extremely well in proper conditions. When you you know you look at the military, the military is a war machine with two groups against another group, but within it, there's great camaraderie. There's a deeply collaborative structure. So you have this con- this constant duality between the two things, and what it all comes down to in terms of human behavior is the structure that we're living in. The chimpanzees and bonobos are the best analogs. I think I've described this to you before. I'll just do it very briefly for your audience. You know, chimpanzees and bonobos are virtually genetically identical, or at least they were, and bonobos are the most genetically identical to, identical to humans in the primate species. Many, many millions of years ago, I believe there was a, a river that formed that divided what was one species, and they turned into chimpanzees on one side and bonobos on the other. The chimpanzees' exposure was to very harsh desert culture, so to speak, or excuse me, it was a desert culture that was generated. By the way, this mirrors uh, human evolution too, but I won't go down that road in terms of desert versus rainforest cultures. But this is basically uh, the equivalency on the anal- analog primate level. And so chimpanzees grew up in harsh desert, scarce the environments, became very organized in, in warring and, and violence and you know, all the tendencies that we kind of recognize, oh, that, oh, that just must be our human, human nature as well. And then you have the bonobos, which had a very different evolution in lush rainforest style regions with great abundance. And they do not have the rates of violence and they have very different problem solving mechanisms, very different hierarchical arrangements. In some cases, the females are in the hierarchy, very flexible, very strange. It's completely anomalous compared to the chimpanzees. So what that means to us is that if we can create a social structure, which we can, that actually allows for abundance, allows for an ease of stress. I mean, in our society today, because it's, again, a scarcity exploitating society without fail, it's like you have no way to work around it. The entire premise of the economy is based on exploiting scarcity, not harnessing abundance. If you have um, an, a society that's, that's doing that to you, you're constantly pinging your amygdala in your brain because the stress and the fear of your life, because you know, everyone's living paycheck to paycheck to one degree or another. I live project to project. I have no idea if another project I'll do will ever you know, allow me to survive for the next couple of years. We have no sense of security. And that is a deeply sick thing to do to, uh, to a culture because it builds neuroses. And that, I think, really defines that culture of competition and sports and UFC, it's this cultural amalgamation of this tension that's been building for so long because of this sense of fear that we constantly have in our surroundings and our insecurity, survival-wise, and we've literally developed a neurotic culture. And that's one of the most dangerous things to try and overcome. In fact, I'll just say this to conclude that point. The, 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 found, excuse me, the, uh, the foundation, the groundwork of what has created patterns of institutional behavior, of culture and so forth, you know, most likely since the Neolithic Revolution, that's the core inflection point in my mind. The discovery of agriculture it created the divisions of society. We, we developed property and this whole evolution that emerged. Um, this has developed a culture which is that much harder to get past. It's kind of like um, inner city gangs. 
we know that the, the deprivation uh, has created inner city gangs. It, it exists. These people have come, and in many cases, minorities that have come from you know, deep oppression over generations, and they develop gangs. But what happens after that? It's, not, it's no longer about survival after a certain point. It's about a culture. So a culture of gang behavior. And then you have generations of people that might be able to get out of the, you know, the problem of the scarcity that originally started this, but they've manifested the culture. And this is by far the most troubling aspect of what we've become as a species in modern civilization. We are moving away from all the origin points that we can understand as to why we are the way we are. And we're developing a new neurotic uh, enveloping state that we have forgotten why we even are the way we are building in this, this, this snowballing feedback loop towards our demise. So that's really troubling. And that's why when people often ask me, like, well, a resource-based economy, why do, would this happen? Like, what, what would happen if this person did this? There's all these what ifs, because most, most notoriously, people are locked into a world where they only know what they see, and they have not been trained to have any sense of causality as to why things have come to where they are. And that's, you know, that's the fundamental problem of the activist community. And it's not putting down activists. So I, anyone that actually has the courage to be an activist, to go out there and buck the system on any level should be, you know, should be prideful and should be respected. But the fundamental philosophy of activism has been built into this superficiality where we don't have any kind of true systemic structural sense of how we got to where we are or what the driving dynamics are that keep us there. And until we, you know, evaluate that, it's literally just, you know, shooting darts or just be attacking groups and attacking politicians and people and thinking that people are the problem when, uh, when people actually are not the problem. We are, we are throughputs in this reality. And there is something that has come before us. As much as we'd like to believe that we have our free will, and to an extent we do, we have to remember that everything we think and know was taught to us. Everything that we associate with has been conditioned into us. And that type of awareness is still very, very lacking. That's basically the sociological foundation, again, of the podcast I put forward and the way I approach all problem solving, going back to your, your point about it, which, and just to conclude my rambling, is so difficult. It's so difficult to talk about the sociological level because people really just want to believe that they can get rid of some group or some institution and everything will be fine. But that's just not the way, it's, that's not the way it is. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Right. I mean, it, especially because our system today is not actually based on scarcity anymore. I mean, it, it, we live in a time of overabundance, which manifests into all of these disturbing aspects that you're describing now. And I mean, the sociological aspect of kind of the historical amnesia of where we were 100 years ago in this country, you know, the militant labor movement, all the things that advanced the menial uh, social gains that have been stripped down ever since. I mean, it, the fact that Bernie Sanders was considered this revolutionary figure when really he just kind of mirrored what the New Deal. Um, right. It's a lot of ignorance, deep-seated ignorance. And then, of course, it manifests into very disturbing ways where, you know, this conspiracism to explain away everything, this kind of uh, this um, dysfunctionality, really, when it comes to understanding basic concepts. I mean, look at like... I mean, it, it manifests, of course, with different partisan lenses, but, um, you know, something like Russiagate, for example, to explain away why Donald Trump won in our alleged democracy. And then you had kind of the other camp falling prey to the QAnon uh, kind of cult-like type thinking. I know that you don't like to use that word, but it really is, uh, it, it's so fascinating to see how these things play out. And you've talked about this too, like this alienation, um, going back to the concept of, you know, the communal aspect of human civilization and how it's progressed. And especially after I had a child and realizing that whole theme of like, it takes a village. It, it really does. It right. really applies to everything in life, how you need a support system to not feel like you're completely overwhelmed and atomized and just completely left to fend for yourself. And it really does feel completely debilitating. And I think that as we navigate, um, the landscape of information right now, there is this tendency to have this kind of reflexive contrarianism when you're looking at something like an establishment narrative because of, of the myth making, because of the pathological line on behalf of politicians. And for yeah. example, you mentioned the war in Ukraine. 
this complicated geopolitical situation has been truncated into like a cartoon binary. You know, Putin is only doing this because he's evil and we're good and Zelensky's a hero. And, you know, and then you have the mass censorship effect, this infantilizing notion of, um, you know, that we're children and we need to be have our reality curated for us by tech giants. And it's just really sad because it breeds this deep institutional distrust, which you would hope would manifest into something beneficial that, OK, we all know that the system is failing us. It's not serving us. And we all know that politicians and the media are lying. So where do we go from there? But people are just increasingly losing their grip on reality. And the magical thinking is resonating more and more despite the access to information, Peter. Yeah, I it, it is counterintuitive. Uh, it's very interesting. I like how you used the phrase, I think it was reflexive contrarianism. Is that what you said? Yeah. Because I use the phrase impulsive skepticism. So <laughs> I think those are synonymous. Uh, remember the old um, <clears throat> Frederick Douglass quote, I'll paraphrase, you know, any group of people made to feel that there is an active conspiracy against them, made to feel is the operant, you know, phrase there. Uh, no persons or property will be safe. And you have an entire society that's predicated effectively on exploitation one way or another, no matter how people want to spin that. It's still an exploitative society. That is exactly what the modus operandi is. And you're going to have tremendous in a disadvantage. In fact, it's a mathematical result that you're going to have vast class inequality. This has been modeled by computer scientists. You put the market system into a computer, you put the proper parameters in, you allocate a certain amount of money, forget you know, forget the debt-based currency or whatever, forget all the, the layers of argument that creates inequality on this planet. The very structure of markets will separate uh, the, the rich minority from the poor majority. It's literally inevitable, which is why government is the only kind of you know, uh, apparatus we have to try and circumvent that. And again, I won't keep deviating down these tangents, but the reason, of course, the government fails to regulate inequality is because the government is compromised by the same power figures and by nature of the structure, because the political establishment we have today is built upon the economic establishment and not the other way around. That's a very common misconception people have. They think politics is the highest order, especially in democracy, and it's through that we change what's below, excuse me, we change what, whatever happens, and including the economy, but what is below is actually more powerful because you're dealing with the very incentives required for survival and the kind of blinkering and pathology that's created with people in power. Um, and it's like that scene in Inner Reflections where I have this, this kind of cliche scene where this guy gives a speech about how no billionaires are helping him resolve poverty. And I really believe that when people reach that kind of status of wealth attainment, that their brains on average become malformed, their values become distorted. <laughs> I really believe this. It's actually statistically shown, you know, University of California uh, did a bunch of studies. Um, and I'm sure plenty of other people have done it as well, regarding what happens to people when they get more, more uh, economic benefit and their, their personality changes. It's, it's not a far-fetched thing. It's not universal, but, you know, they're more rude. They will cheat more. It's like, a, it's basically Donald Trump. It's like everything that Donald Trump is, uh, is an amalgamation of the psychology of the system that's embedded inside of them. So um, I completely forgot what the hell I was going with that. Can you mind reminding me? What we no. Yeah. About? I mean, I mean, let me jump in here and maybe you yeah. can feed off of this. I mean, <laughs> It's yeah, like you said, I mean, there's this tendency to think that we can vote with our dollar like we have the power as the consumer. But like, no, we don't. The, the monopolization of cap like monopoly capitalism has completely consolidated almost every single industry to the point where like I um, these brands own everything. It's impossible to vote with your dollar or even boycott certain corporations for like unethical practices or human rights abuses. And going back to that fallacy that the market will self-regulate, those in power of the corporations, those in power of the lawmaking will not be incentivized to do the right thing. They will always kick the can down to the next yeah. generation out of self-preservation of status and privilege. And even if one CEO or politician did want to change direction, they'd be kicked out of the club. Yeah. The machine's too big for one cog to change course. Absolutely. The short term view at the long term expense is absolutely uh, the way all things are approached. Most CEOs know they're not going to be around forever. They just want to do what they can to get their big bonus and to have a good reputation with their company and so on and so on. Uh, that is that is a very big problem. Absolutely. Uh, the voting with your dollar thing is funny to me because the, the joke is inside of it. Well, of course, people vote with their daughter. You know why? Because the billionaires clearly have more power than, than everybody else. Yeah, so, dollar. Yeah, vote, vote with your dollar. Vote fine. with your Let's... nickel. 
Yeah. <laughs> not going to get very far. It's really hilarious, and especially going back to the activist community. Again, I appreciate the idea of boycotting this and that. Uh, there is a small effect that it has, but the fact that it's propped up as if this is the method of social change is, of course, uh, just way too weak to be acknowledged. Um, but I, I just I, real briefly, I, re- I remember what I was going to say uh, yeah, go for re- it. regarding prior, and that was the fact of conspiracy culture. And this is something we're addressing since we brought up Zeitgeist, which has all sorts of unique interpretations on that level. The the conspiracy element is is we've reached this point of impulsive skepticism and a complete detachment from reality where people don't even have a framework of understanding. Uh, I you know a lot of people look at the the kind of QAnon Trumpian folks with a great deal of derision and rightfully so, but at the same time you have, you have to feel bad for them because they don't they haven't been given the tools to think properly and they have been deeply deeply molded by a group think. Uh, effectively cultish mentality. So we've we've adapted a society now with all this wonderful information that has been so prolific, and yet it's so overwhelming that we have pockets and bubbles. And now people can go to the internet and they can see only what they want to see. They can verify their own bias as opposed to you know finding information that challenges them. The social media architecture is built precisely the same way. So all these different uh, confluences have come together to really frighteningly detach uh, society, like uh, bubbles of thought that you think were long gone, like people thinking the earth was flat, you know, with the exception of, say, like old religious communities. Now you have this like bewildering youth culture that it believes this stuff and they pride themselves in it. And they have a whole little fun group of people that, you know, go to little conferences and they d- discuss all the dynamics of the earth being flat. Like it's truly <laughs> it's truly mind numbing when you think about this. And it's one more thing that I think is a, is an outgrowth of the cultural neuroses that and unfortunately keeps the cynicism in my mind when I think about avenues for social change. Like, how do you get a hold of something like that when it's flying so far off the handle? When when Alex Jones is literally being embraced on Fox News? Like, how do you... <laughs> we, we've reached a very, very tragic point when it comes to the evolution of disinformation and just complete confusion. And I definitely uh, worry about that. Uh, well, it's also like mainstreaming... Um kind of like partisan belief, like partisan conspiracism. I don't even know if that makes sense. It's like weird. All of the QAnon kind of weird mentality that we're talking about has been kind of filtered and almost emboldened aspects of like the ruling class. Whereas, you know, this kind of deep, um, like historic understanding of like, what is the deep state, this kind of more kind of left, I guess you could say, critique of power and capital and um and that seems to be lost completely because it's all been kind of funneled into this weird outgrowth of like something that reinforces capitalism in a weird way and just the the structural order that we're kind of paralyzed by um yeah you know i wanted to also i mean there's so much that i want to fucking say about the disinformation thing but i you know it is so interesting too that like you had a podcast recently where you were talking about market externalities and how like capitalism, the, another great myth about it is the fact that it can also solve poverty or homelessness or pollution. And it reminds me of, you know, being at COP26, these annual climate negotiations, and I was in Scotland and it really was just one giant trade show. You know, every country had a booth sponsored by banks and oil companies and really every plenary and panel was just politicians and activists quote unquote talking about how corporations are going to save us <laughs> net zero the concept of net zero no, no no we don't need to stop drilling we don't need to stop taking the shit from the ground we just need to offset the carbon emissions by planting a couple trees right. it was surreal because i just thought first of all how much money are you guys wasting patting yourselves on the back walking away with absolutely nothing done kicking the can down the road and then having you know the sea of access journalists just there for access there to climb the corporate ladder and being there Surrounded by oil lobbyists, by the way, that was like the largest contingent out of the entire uh, the entire um, COP26 was oil lobbyists. <laughs> of course. But I remember asking, you know, I got I got a I got a chance to ask Nancy Pelosi a question. She only called on me because I was a woman. It was the one time in my life that identity politics worked in my favor. But <laughs> it was incredible because I asked her about, you know, how can we take net zero seriously? How is any of this? You know, not just a complete joke if you're not talking about the elephant in the room, which, of course, the fact that they don't even count carbon emissions from any military 
in the world. Yeah. And her answer was really instructive and very disturbing. I mean, she basically just talked about how they need the military. They need a bigger and, and stronger military, Peter, A, because the oceans are going to rise. So we need a bigger Navy. And B, we need the military to mitigate like the uh, the instability that will arise from the effects of climate change. So kind of in a disturbing fashion, she was kind of hinting to the fact that we need a stronger military to prevent the influx of refugees coming in this country. Like we need that yeah. ultra security state to crack down on on just the effects. And, and it was kind of just throwing their hands up in the air being like, look, this is inevitable and we're going to need the military to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And it brings me back to the point of this notion that regulatory bodies like don't serve a purpose that they need to. You know, it was only due to this massive militant labor movement that forced the hand of government to curb the unregulated nature of corporations to pollute at will. And mm -hmm. now these agencies have been totally captured by corporate power and they just exist now to help shield them from accountability. The Supreme yeah. Court was recently hearing a case to severely strangle the EPA's ability to address climate change. And meanwhile, Peter, the IPCC just came out with a final warning. Like these yeah. scientists here in LA just chain themselves to, you know, I don't even know what bank it was. All of them are culpable, but like just saying, I mean, really doing kind of militant action here, scientists, because no one's listening to them. And I don't, I don't even know where I'm going with this, but if you want to comment on any of that. Absolutely. Uh, first, I think the, the Pelosi thing is so great and, and it's hilarity because what she described to you is one of the central problems of the entire system is that we're creating problems and that we're trying to create solutions to those problems, which continue to create more of the same problems. Uh, this could be talked about with war in general. Uh, you know, how many bombs with the old joke of like, how many terrorists will this new bomb bring? <laughs> because, you know, where you foment this kind of reactionism, you know, oil, obviously the U.S. military would be an enormous polluter. And what? Oh, we're going to we're going to still going to need we're going to pollute the environment more so. And we're going to cause instability. But we're going to need the military that uses that oil to solve the instability. So you see the ridiculousness of the reinforcing feedback loops. And that that's a whole other subject. And that's why um, that's why, I, again, I'm cynical on the nature of, of what we're doing right now in terms of problem resolution, because there are some really powerful feedback loops that are very, very difficult to overcome, which we can talk more about. Um, in fact, let me just address something real fast since I yeah. just jumped on that. The, the three major defining problems that people need to remember when it comes to, to markets and market capitalism as it's evolved, as it's adapted up into the modern age. Uh, there's a background to it I won't go into in terms of why they are the way they are and how they were less severe historically. I won't go into all of that. But the first has to do with the ecological crisis and the fact the system requires growth. It requires consumption and growth. A lot of people right now in the degrowth communities are arguing that we can have this kind of market structure and we can create variations of it to not need the growth economy, which is completely ridiculous. You, you, the system... The system's growth mechanisms are based, again, on the constant need for consumption to keep people employed, the self-regulation, the competitive self-regulation, which also interplays with that because these companies are constantly trying to outdo each other. Therefore, they want to get more capital expansion. They want to get more employees, more land. There's a threshold, of course. But let's look at Amazon. Amazon has slowly wiped out so many other companies just because they have the resources to do it and it becomes its own feedback loop once again because the bigger they get, the cheaper their products become and so on. And the third issue related to the inevitability of a growth economy is we still maintain for thousands of years, and it's not, uh, it's not intrinsic to the nature of our money exactly, it's intrinsic to the system, we maintain a debt-based monetary system. And that system produces more interest than can be solved in the principled money supply. Is I wish more people talked about this because it's just frightening. And no, it will not be resolved by Bitcoin for those that think it will be because it's built into the very structure of the entire market dynamic because debt goes back five, 6,000 years. In fact, debt existed before even currency existed, which is interesting to think about. So there's more, there's more money that has to be paid back to these banks than actually exist in nature. So that's why historically you've had debt jubilees as well because it's, you know, even though in, intuitively they did that, they didn't realize that it was mathematically inevitability. The fourth issue to blast through these is consumer culture, which we've manifested once again as this neurotic outcome. We've developed now a culture of people that behave a certain way. They're acquisitive. They're insatiable. They pride themselves on acquisition. They go to the mall for fun. 
Uh, we, it's just insane. And then, of course, economic stimulus, which is that fundamental thing that has to happen because of the lack of integrity of the system as the whole, just like with COVID. You have enormous amounts of economic stimulus constantly pushed into the system to avoid recession. And that is a chicken that's about to come home to roost for, for the West after trillions of dollars of COVID money put in. But they never let it actually stabilize. They always put in more. It's always inching as far as they can go until, of course, a major crash happens. But then again, it just picks up right where it left off. Left off. So that's, that's and, they'll, and they'll reap the benefits, of course, of the crash. Absolutely. Do. That is, as I talk about in my book, every single crash always makes the wealthy more wealthy at the end of the day. I mean, COVID was more hilarious just because, you know, the the shutdown of fundamental uh, Main Street just left the billionaire institutions, the Jeff Bezos of the world. They, I mean, these guys and Tesla, they made so much money. It's outrageous while everyone else suffered. I mean, if that isn't indicative of just how divided the class structure is and the class war, as it were, how valid that concept is. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, there was that statistic that you probably would know because you have a fucking encyclopedic memory, but of like the actual trillion dollars that was like essentially stolen from the poorest during the pandemic. And then that exact same amount of money was what the richest made. (laughs) It's like literally. Absolutely. I mean, and of course the channels, I mean, we can go down the rabbit hole with that. The, The way stimulus is actually introduced in society usually is through the financial system, which means these horrible hegemonic hedge funds and and various banking institutions are the ones that get this money first they're the ones mm-hmm. that get to play with this money before it trickles down to the rest of the economy but that's a kind of cronyism that's built into it but it's to be expected and that's you know, that's one of those words i use very sparringly well um, well especially because yeah no that that's a perfect segue of like people call write this off because of course no one can agree that this is like the best system that we can do right but but people will deflect and be like no no no, this is just crony capitalism no 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 this is just corruption yeah um and like you said like like that um that call to just replace them with better people or people who are libertarian or people who do this and that and and as you point out time and again like this is the natural gravitation of the competitive nature of the system. So like, you know, what stage capitalism is this, that kind of trope that you see time and again? I mean, it reminds me of, um, to your point about how you cannot solve poverty and pollution under the system because there, there is no market solution for solving the externalities that are produced from capitalism. But like, it reminds me of um, two things. A, Goldman Sachs coming out saying, you know, those those private memos where they were like, is curing cancer really a sustainable business model? <laughs> you know? I know. It's funny how the truth leaks out sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, I don't think that you can sum it up in any other way other than that. And then I also yeah. just hilariously talking about Bitcoin and NFTs. This is just very dystopian. And I think in, like just really exemplifies where we're at. Um, the AP um was selling an nft get this of refugees on a boat in the mediterranean that will probably fucking die as they do frequently (laughs) and like literally like i'll never forget it a news organization selling an nft being like all right nfts up guys like bidding war begins and it's just like what fucking stage capitalism is this like or is this just the dystopian hell that we're living in like I, I, it's, it is uh, deeply troubling. Um, before I forget, however, let me finish my point regarding the three feedback loops, because we can touch upon that as yeah, well yeah, in go. this evolution. So we just tackled the economic growth one, which again, you punch this into a computer, the, the dynamics of agent behavior in a capitalist economy will always erode their, their, uh, their resources into oblivion by default because of the very nature of the system. Then you have the second most tragic feedback loop, which is the inequality generation I mentioned earlier. That is the fact that mathematically, left to its own devices with no intervention, the system will always allocate disproportionately and extremely so. And then you have the third one, which is a little bit more difficult to express. I, and I think the last podcast I talked about what's called the ice, iceberg model, which is a basic sociological model that is very common. You, you have events like, say, school shootings. You know, someone goes and shoots somebody in mass shooting. Then you have a pattern, which is the, uh, the enormous number of school shootings or, excuse me, mass shootings that we have. We have well over 100 in the United States alone, uh, fairly indiscriminate mass shootings, you know, just anger shootings. And then you have the structure, which means that you have an event, you have a pattern of events, and then you have a structure or structures, depending on how you look at it, that's creating the pattern, right? 
And that is a fundamental you know, framework. And within that framework, there's something else that's underneath it called a mental model. And this is based on an assumption that the people that engage, you know, the, all of us that are thinking, wandering around this planet, we must be creating the structure, right, as the starting point. And this is, again, this goes back to a psychological view of reality. It's very false. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems we have in the, in, the, in the perception of people out there today. The fact that it's thought that we are the point of origin. It's an egoism that we have. It's built into our free will, just like in our criminal justice system. You know, no one asks what happened to these people, very rarely, unless someone has an insanity plea. No one asks, you know, what happened in poverty or whatnot to someone to go pickpocket somebody else and then they get thrown in jail. It's all based on a completely free will notion, like you're, you're responsible. You know, it's the same conservative thinking that bleeds over into other ideologies, like, oh, you get what you work for. Oh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The system can't possibly be oppressive in any way. You, it's always up to you and you and you. And so that psychology is deeply built into this mental model concept and this is you know I, I won't list names of who goes through this kind of thinking but it's it's endless almost every single major political commentary person i've met in economics or listened to still believes that we have to just make decisions okay and that and, and that's half true and that's the problem and what i'm getting at here is that the structure the structure of our society as alluded to before the culture it creates the incentives it has the rewards the punishments is codifying the human brain on average creating certain patterns of behavior so there's a nasty feedback loop between the structure and people's way of thinking the men mental model and that is the third feedback loop everything that's happening in society right now is constantly trying to drive interest back into the established system you made a unique point earlier about how all of this stuff that's come forward, um, I'll use the example of the rise of Trump. So we have a terrible, you know, demo publican, horrible political establishment across the world. But the United States is the easiest example in terms of, you know, the fundamental neuroses that we're talking about. Um, and so he rises. What has he actually done, really? He's set up system preservation because people are so horrified of this character. They're now going back to George Bush and Obama and thinking these guys were great. <laughs> this is what we need. Right. So there's there's that's one example of these multiple feedback loops that are keeping people in a position to preserve in the short term or to think that, you know, this is just the way it is and anything else should be feared. And that is by far the most uh, treacherous area because that's where the activists have to come in. So now I'll say that, you know, if we're going to move away from this kind of system, we have to begin building a smaller version of a new system and scaling it out. It's a common sense notion. It's been thought about by a couple people out there, but has never really been pursued. But that's a big focus of mine in the background right now and will be paired in with Zeitgeist 4. Uh, zeitgeist addendum triggered the zeitgeist movement, which has had a unique organic rise and has stabilized with you know, still great communities across the world. Now it's time for an actual institutional development that gets people off the goddamn grid of market capitalism. And it can be done. And that's the beauty of what we've but the, the core economic drive, the core benefit as we as an innovative species, our ability to create and to innovate is to be able to produce things where we do more and more and more with less and less and less. And that is the core economic interest. That's why things should be getting cheaper now, if it wasn't, for, of course, for the profit center, profit incentive, excuse me. If we harness that as activists, we start to build new systems that are going to naturally become more resource, excuse me, less resource intensive and, and quote, less costly. Granted, I say costly, that's within the bounds of a market you know, distinction, but less intensive, less labor intensive, less resource intensive. We are on the verge of being able to harness that to create a parallel organization of civilization. And that's the only way I see getting out of this. I don't think we're going to be able to rise up and you know, overthrow this or create enough political you know, fermentation to conquer this problem. I think those days are over unless you want just straight violence, uh, which, of course, is what we're fighting against anyway, because when those three feedback loops continue their process as the ecological decline feedback loop, continues as the inequality feedback loop continues, which is deeply caustic, not only on the domestic scale, but on the international scale. And then the mental model problem with the fact that people are consistently reinforced with the same sick value system, the sick incentives. Those three things are going to are, are basically one giant loop that is assuring our demise if we don't move fairly quickly with new system development, pulling people into a new, mo new mode of behavior. And I'll just conclude by saying that that new mode, of course, has to be minimalistic. And that is one of the most difficult cultural things 
to all those people listening that, you know, are still locked into this world of material, remember this. And it's not necessarily a Buddhist notion. I think it's a pure psychological notion. The more you think you need, the more you are basically, um, the more you are insecure in a way that needs to be resolved through other means. The most insightful, I should say the most, uh, can't I can't get the right word, the most pronounced moment, I think, <laughs> I can't talk, the most, uh, fuck, what a, <laughs> oh, I gotta find the right word here. I hate it when I have a word; it just doesn't, it doesn't decide to come out. When one word doesn't come to you out of the hour straight, of uh, we'll use the word enlightenment. The most yeah, enlightened position is someone that can sit and not need fucking anything. Mm-hmm. If you can start to train yourself to think that way, and every time you see something, or every time you strive for something, or you feel that drive to want to attain, it doesn't necessarily have to be material. But the most balanced state you can be in is one, a Zen, if you will, it could be considered a Buddhist philosophy, is one where you don't actually need it. Because the sickness of having like multi-room mansions and jets, I mean, the liability of that, think about the kind of mental insecurity that underscores that necessity to have an interest for more and more and more. And uh, it's unfortunate that that value system, of course, is promulgated by people in power. And that's another part of this feedback loop, which I'll conclude with, is one of the reasons things are not changing is because this value system is ingrained. Everyone gets more money. They become more famous. They become more powerful. And these are the, these become the figure figureheads of the values of society. And that's that's another treacherous um, angle of this. It's it's really dark. Oh, my God. I mean, you just said so many incredible things. I mean, yeah, these dominant feedback loops are affect everyone. I mean, even the most well-intentioned and passionate activists, many liberals, for example, who are like naturally repelled by war and poverty and want to do something about it, they are stunted um, yeah. due to the nature of the system by electoralism or local activism. And it, I mean, it reminds me of just the speech from Carl Sagan that you recently showed, or I'm sorry, played on your mm-hmm. podcast. I mean, this, I was shocked to mm. learn that in 1984, Five. Yeah. Carl yeah. Sagan. Uh, rest his soul. Fucking brilliant man right there. Really, really amazing guy. I mean, the fact that he had the foresight to be out there that long ago, a year after I was born, talking about, you know, something that 50 years later, we are really dealing with potential apocalyptic cataclysmic changes in the climate in the next 10 years, Peter, if we don't do anything about it, which I think that it's far too gone to do anything about now. And I mean, bringing me to the point of of also groupthink. I mean, wanting to belong to something, wanting to not deviate from what, everything that you've known. You know, the status quo is a mentality of even if you are so well-intentioned and you realize that, you know, this is not the way that things should be, you still – it's so paralyzing and debilitating to think of being able to do anything to change something that is global. And so this now global awareness and global interconnectedness that we have this consciousness that I feel like has just expanded more and more, but at the same time, the debilitation of the overwhelming nature of the information that's coming at us, that it's all of these different dynamics coupled together that really do make it very difficult to navigate Um, And unfortunately, because anti-communism is the bedrock of our society, I think people look at the centralization of power or anything related to the government as totalitarianism. And like they just think that freedom equates to free markets, right? You we're all millionaires in the waiting. Like we all just have to work hard enough and we can be the next Elon Musk. And don't get me started on how Elon Musk is like the dumbest motherfucker to ever ever walk the earth. <laughs> somehow he's the richest person. What does that say about the nature of the, of the economy, especially because he's somehow called a renegade? Sorry, right. but that, that, those two things can't be true at the same time. You can't be a renegade and be the richest man on earth. Sorry. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but, but this fear, this fear of the other, of something else other than what we've always known, I think is very difficult difficult for people to confront because it must mean, right, that you have no freedom or creativity to do anything. We'd all be clones living in Orwell's 1984. So I guess just address that kind of binary of freedom versus totalitarianism with something that is, you know, for me, it's like, look, we either have a planned economy or we don't organize accordingly to our needs and in conjunction with the limitations of a finite planet. And it's, yeah, it's really fucking scary to think of what a global transformation of the economy would look like, but it's a better option than 
not having the human race survive because we literally do not have a choice any right. longer. And it ha and I used to think, oh, it must stem from like a massive shift in consciousness to understand the scale and urgency of this. But it's not just an issue of like morality and empathy and media literacy. Like, I don't know what it is, Peter, because it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, first, you need the consciousness to embrace something so dramatic of a change. But at the same right. time, it seems like the machine is operating on its own. And that people have to be like what Mario Savio said, like we literally have to put our bodies on the gears of this, this machine to save the future of humanity. Yeah, I, very good points, very difficult points uh, subject wise. I, I, I think you hit it well when it comes to the chicken, the egg concept. And my response to that is you have to not only educate people to know what a proper, you know, sustainable public health respecting society would be the parameters of which are very obvious, but you have to put people in a situation where they begin to experience how that feels in terms of their day-to-day -day life. And that that's fairly common sense. There have been people out there that have tried, as I mentioned earlier, tried to develop communities that you know could start to do that. In most cases, they fail miserably. There's a couple smaller places in India and the like, but they, they're so small that they just they're just anomalous communities. They don't they wouldn't serve the function. Their values would, but the the actual technologies that they use wouldn't serve the function for mass, you know, mass social survival. So that is by far the most difficult. And going back to what you said, you know, everyone wants to think, at least most people want to think it comes down to individual choice. And if we all just make different choices within the structure, and that's by far the most enraging thing, by the way, I always keep hearing people talk about that want to preserve the system. And don't even uh, get me started on, on the manifesting your own reality thing. It's like, yeah, let's just yeah, it, manifest our reality. That, that'll that'll turn out well. You know, I think you know, it's interesting you bring that up as an aside. I'm, I have some notes here based on what you said as well I'll get back to, is in the 60s, you know, you had this sort of kind of revolutionary moment in, in terms of, well, I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't a revolution in terms of society whatsoever, but there was a weird kind of fusion of things. You know, everything was breaking in a particular way. The psychedelic revolution, the uniformity of art started to merge. You had experimentation. You had more sexual freedom, for better or for worse. There's, you know, lots of sick institutions like Playboy that emerged and stuff like that. Uh, with, you know, all sorts of different manipulative elements. But within the confines of, of this evolution, there was some positivity to breaking molds, right? And what happened, though, is once the kind of 80s and 90s rolled around, all those idealists, all those hippies, as it were, all those changers, the revolutionaries, you know, protesting the Vietnam War, they completely acquiesced. And then they started to create the philosophy of inward revolution. So now you have everyone mm -hmm. going to meditation groups and, yep. you know, and, and even in some cases, even though I think, you know, you know like ayahuasca sessions, stuff like that can be broadly widening many people use that unfortunately still to preserve their own internal well-being working to ignore their surroundings so you have this self-help kind of thing that's emerged now and that's still most prominent i mean look at the self-help i mean all these people are growing up in this society they feel horrible they don't know why they feel you know alienated or why they're depressed they don't understand the dynamics because i think it's fundamentally a natural and you know very profound level to raise people in this kind of world and since they don't know what it is they think something wrong with them and then you have the therapy you know so it's all great for the uh, psychiatrists and the psychologists and the uh, the self-help people to have a sick society like this but that's where the evolution has morphed in terms of culture so very rarely do you hear anyone talk about structural anything it's right it's, it's just hyper it folds into the hyper individualism absolutely and uh while there is of course relevance to people breaking their molds of thought and seeing things differently what you realize about the human being is we're deeply vulnerable we're a throughput if something isn't reinforced that we're idealizing then we're not necessarily going to pursue it. And you'll occasionally get a few heroes. I use that example of like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or some of these folks that have kind of risen above and you know, criticized culture to whatever degree and trying to be revolutionary. Uh, those, are, those are the few and far between. Statistically speaking, everyone is just trying to survive in their paycheck to paycheck world. They can't think about philosophy. It's like that old George Carlin quote, you know, some people think about what is and ask why. Some people think about what isn't and ask why not. Some people, <laughs> some people have to go to work and don't have time for all that shit, <laughs> which, summarize, which summarizes effectively this paralysis once again, that people are not given the freedom to breathe because they're so stressed by their fundamental existence. Now, uh, going back to your comment about um, the fear of anything other than capitalism basically being totalitarianism. I really liked what you said in terms of a lack of creativity and that Ayn Rand sort of thing where there's no identity because 
ironically, that's precisely what capitalism has done. Capitalism has created a self-preserving institution. It's like a, it's like a monster. I, I often attribute the system to an organism identity because it behaves in its own way because of the collective impression, because of the way people react to each other in these various feedback loops, it creates this, this sort of organism that has a life of its own. And it sort of preserves itself through all sorts of unique, uh, kind of, I'm being esoteric here, but it, that's the way I think the best way to visualize it. It's like a system that has a mind of its own that we are, are inside of in, in this complicated chemistry and we can't break away from. And when we do try to break away from this system has uh, antibodies that come after us and tries to take us out in various different ways in order to preserve itself. And one of the ways it does that is by the false duality. You can't have any conversation with the, the traditional person and bring up anything other than capitalism without them instantly bringing up, you know, the failures of socialism or the Soviet Union or, you know, or communism or, and, and this just tremendous failure of creativity. Like we, what, this is it? This is, this is our polarized reality. There's no other option. You know, in the work that I've done and many others around me, what you're going to end up with in the future, if we can get past this hurdle, is not some central planning arrangement. It's going to be a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer kind, of, kind of network of civilization pockets. I talk about it in my book. It's what Gandhi often referred to because he was intuitively against mass industrialization because he could see the kind of power networks that would be created uh, that would be inhibiting and basically create more poverty and inequality, which is precisely what it has done in the long run. And so you end up with a kind of a, a floating parallel series of societies that are independent as much as possible. And when they can't be independent, they use their peer-to-peer -peer decentralized nature to engage forms of transactions, not monetary in most cases, ideally, but are able to gain resources and services and acquisitions through a concentrated network that is not centralized, but decentralized, but networked. And that's something that people in the networking communities out there, if anyone does programming, they're very much aware of that in the open source community. Uh, but that's not something that most political figure people ever talk about. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. it's always just central planning and like, oh, it's just going to be a bunch of bureaucrats sitting at a table deciding what everyone gets. Uh, that's anyway, I won't go down that road of all the other permutations, but this failure of creativity is another stifling form. That's going to be the death of us. I mean, what? That's all you can think of people. <laughs> well, right. That, that's they want to confine us into that line of thinking because they don't want us to envision a utopian society. Uh, a beautifully democratized and symbiotic ecosystem that can exist where people can collaboratively work right. together and grow society. Um, Peter, let's open it up to some callers here to close this out. Uh, this Sounds has been good. an incredible conversation. 